This is Neon Galactic, a YouTube podcast produced by Key TV. I'm your host, James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Sometimes in life, there's a very real sense among a lot of people that rather than living in a cold and different world of atoms and molecules coming together and breaking apart, that there is an underlying sense and meaning to the universe that we as a species have to better understand if we're ever going to break out of our long-running doom cycles. This meaning, or some might even call it an intention, is shown to us through signs that arise and fall away through the mechanisms of physical phenomenon. In humanity's younger days, we had people dedicated to submerging their minds and bodies into the realm of this communicating intelligence to bring back wisdom and understanding. The shamanic tradition has since largely passed from human consciousness, though remnants still remain, and I think we're all now learning in our slow and stubborn way that a lot of that ancient wisdom and power was based on facts they had actually experienced. Our guest today, author and researcher Mike Cleland, has spent many years diving deep into some of these kinds of phenomenon, in particular, how the owl works in this broader symbolic system, if it, indeed that's what it is, and how synchronicities can help shape the meaning of our lives. He's also worked on relating the paranormal or just plain odd experience of owl sightings and confrontations with the UFO phenomenon, working to find patterns in detail in the massive number of stories he's collected. His book, the Messengers, Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee is a compendium of this research and a great read for those seeking to better understand how the UFO NHI phenomenon interacts with us, with our minds, and with nature as a whole. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Mike Cleland to the show. Thank Thanks you so for much. Joining us. Yeah, it's my honor. I uh, I got to remember to pause there so that you can say, well, thank you, and then we go oh, on. Thank you. you know? yeah. My rhythms get all messed up. <laughs> so I loved your book. Um, I think you did a fantastic job uh, com compiling all that information and relating it. Um, let's start with how you, uh, from what I understand, you have a background in sort of like, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of outdoors. Uh, you're an outdoorsman in the hikes in the Rockies and, and that sort of thing. But can you sort of talk about how you fell into this subject matter as a um, target of research? Um, in 2006, I was 44 years old. I'm 61 years old now. So that was... Mm -hmm. 18 years ago, I think. Um, and then uh, I was living in a beautiful part of the world. At the time, I was living in Driggs, Idaho, this gorgeous little town right on the edge of Grand Teton National Park. And I was working for an outdoor school. So the outdoor work that I did was I was on the payroll and I was teaching people outdoor skills. And the trips I was doing, most of them were 30 days long. So wow. we, would, we would get out, we would go into the backcountry and we would spend 30 days isolated in the in the mountains. I mean, we were doing long, big, ambitious trips. We were covering a lot of ground, but wow, we saw almost no one, essentially zero people we would see. And um, and I had been working all summer in Alaska and I came back down to the town where I was living and I met this woman and I said, hey, wow, you've been living in the, this valley all summer long right here with the Tetons and Yellowstone right in your backyard. You must've gotten out in the mountains a lot. And she said, oh, I didn't get out at all, hardly at all. And I'm like, that's terrible. I'll take you camping. So I, so basically, I took a total stranger camping for one night. Now, this may seem a little odd uh, in the culture I was living in, that camping culture. That was, yeah, that's pretty normal. So, so we went camping for one night. And uh, I also do a form of really ultralight backpacking. And so we took almost nothing as far as gear. It was going to be a beautiful night. There was no reason to take a tent. So we went really light. Our plan was just to go out in the afternoon and come back the next morning. Mm -hmm. And so with a light pack, you can get way into the backcountry without much effort. So we were sitting on a big flat rock and I was making dinner on a little camp stove. I was completely in my element. And this woman is named Kristen. And we're still good friends now. I just talked to her recently. And as the sun was setting, an owl flew over us. And then a second owl, and then a third owl. That's and for right, the next yeah. couple of hours, these owls flew over us for what seemed like, I don't know, it just was so powerful. And then as the sun went down, we were lying on our backs and, and we would lay on our backs and the owls would swoop right over us for just a half and they would blink the stars would be blotted out they made no noise it was totally magical so afterwards I, oh that was wonderful that was so awesome let's go camping one more time and then it happened again right it happened almost the exact yeah. same thing All, yeah. except the owls were closer like it was kind of like you know what i mean if you write letters to someone an email and they don't get back to you you send them another email and you put it all in capital letters. That was what it was like. The owls were like, all like boom, boom, boom. Notice me, right? Like Lock sort caps. of yeah. register this. Yeah. 
and I, I have this so that one owl was standing at our feet like a little it was like a 10 inches tall it was cute um but it was like at our feet and i just remember Kristen's face just like like is this really happening and to have it happen once was pretty cool to have it happen twice in a different part of the mountains four days later with the same person was positively i i don't remember from the description was that the same breed of owls or were they different owls Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm convinced they were the same three owls. I have no way to ah, prove that, but I mean, sure. it was like, it's funny, we like hiked in at a different spot. We were probably about three miles away from the spot we were at before. So that's not impossible for three owls, but they were they were like four days later, it was the same, I don't know, I, it's hard to say, but- Well, I mean, and are they even really social animals? I mean, do they get together in groups? You know and... what, what they, as and when owls are young, they they do spend so the all all the owls that fledged from the same nest can spend time together so that's not okay. that unusual but it's a, it's kind of odd and at the time now i didn't say this at the time i wrote a diary entry after it happened but at the time i heard a voice in my head i was looking at real owls i heard a voice in my head that said this has something to do with the ufos now it's funny like i'm when i'm like I didn't say this at the time, like I'm saying it now, I got no problem saying it now. I'm like the cat's out of the bag in this sense there. So, but I referred back to my notes, my original diary entry, and I'm really cautious to say this. My originally diary entry says, the voice in my head said, this has something to do with the UFOs. I'm looking at a real owl. Mm -hmm. This has something to do with the UFOs. You are an abductee. That's what that, the voice said. That occurred to you as a voice in the moment. It could have been my own like higher self. Yeah, it could have been my I mean, own kind of just musings, but like, wow. So I didn't tell that to anyone, but what it did is it forced me to, so after the event, Kristen and I were both kind of spinning. We're like, what are the totem meaning yeah. of owls? What's the spirit meaning of owls? What does this mean? And, uh, and then I was also, so I had started looking into owls, the mystery of owls, which is wonderful. It's filled with folklore and filled with stories and filled with mythology and, 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 and then I started looking into my own UFO experiences. And so so to me, those owls and UFOs right from the beginning, 16 years ago or 18 years ago, are completely folded in on each other. So I, I treat them essentially as the same thing. Now, um, that's how I got into it. Now, let me just back up a little bit. Like I did not invent the association of owls and UFOs. It's well documented in the literature. So I ended up at this time in my life, I had a lot of UFO books on the shelf. And so you get a big fat UFO book, someone writes a book, whether they're doing research or whether they're telling their own personal experiences. Somewhere in there, not every book, but I'll tell you most, a lot of books, somewhere in them, there'll be a paragraph or there'll be a few sentences about owls. Yeah. And I'm the, so I didn't, I, I was well aware of that when I went into the mountains with Kristen and saw those owls. But I, and then in the aftermath, I started a blog. I kind of became known as the owl guy. It didn't take too long before I was asking for people's owl stories because I was posting my own owl stories, including the one with Kristen. And what I was receiving was amazing. So I would ask everyone I interacted with in the field, I'd say, hey, have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And it wasn't 100%, but wow, it was sure enough that there was a very strong pattern people would say, you know what? I had the I have the weirdest story about an owl. No one has ever asked me that question. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting those stories and doing my best to archive them and doing my best to to make sense of the weird patterns that emerged in the research. Yeah. And that's been going on as a, it feels like, it's not quite, but it's pretty darn close to full-time work and it's been that way for 15 years. Okay, so I, I mentioned this in the email to you, and um, I was shook up about it, actually. Um, uh, the day that I corresponded with you, um, the very day, my wife and I, which also happened to be the, um, uh, let's see, uh, 32nd year since my dad passed, the mm, day, okay. right, March 6th. Um, and I went on a walk, uh, after we had exchanged an email, initial email, I went on a walk with my wife in the forest that we live next to. It's about a quarter of a mile um, from our front door. And I've walked in this forest almost every day for uh, three years, four years. I mean, some sometimes more often than others, but I'm always out there. I've seen deer. I've seen bears. I've seen rabbits. You know, I've seen wildlife out there. I have never, ever seen an owl. That day, I saw an owl. Me, and it was, I didn't even spot it. It was pointed out to me by another woman who was passing by me, which, uh, 
I've heard this thing about these kinds of phenomenon that the physical world is kind of like a text sometimes, and that there are messages embedded in the phenomenon that we see, and it's kind of our job to parse them out, right? Um, if we want to live connected lives or whatever. Um, and uh, it seemed like I was being communicated with in that moment. Um, and how the whole thing unfolded was weird because I didn't actually see it. The woman saw it. She pointed at it. She was all, there's an owl. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I knew who I just corresponded with. And I looked over and there was a great horned owl in the tr in a tree. And it was probably uh, 15 feet off the path. And it was in a dark part of the forest. And it was just sitting there watching us. And, you know, owls have sort of like these intimidating eyes and gaze. And uh, but my first thought was to make a joke to the woman. Right. So I turned back to her. And I was uh, like, uh, I forget exactly what joke I was trying to make, but um, I didn't focus on the owl like I should have. And I didn't really I didn't really spend enough time looking at it. And then when I looked back, it was gone and I felt like I lost an opportunity. And I almost like felt mournful about the fact that I didn't really engage with this owl. And, um, you know, later on, I'm like, oh, I think that's a communication about my whole approach sometimes to the subject where it's like surface and I'm using it as a uh not necessarily as a means to a social mechanism but uh, you know it's like I'm more worried about commenting to the person rather than imbibing in that particular moment and it was like hey wake up you know it was kind of the message I got out of it but that literally happened the day I talked to you and I haven't happened since hasn't happened before and uh I was like sh I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. I say that a lot but I'm getting goosebumps just because it was so weird uh and I don't know if that kind of thing just follows you around. I mean, if people that you talk to just end up seeing owls, maybe that's uh, your superpower. <laughs> but, keep uh, going, keep going. I'll fill you in in a second here. Yeah, so. but that was really startling. And again, that sort of um, underlined for me just how we live in like this informational universe that is constantly seething with like kind of messages, whether or not we pick them up or not is, you know, up to each one of us individually. But so that was my experience. And so that's why I'm really excited to talk to you, because that was like one of the few times I've actually been hit on the head with the, you know, here is it's it's real. And I mean, you know, you could explain it away as synchronicity, but the odds of that are just so bizarre. Um, anyway. <laughs> so what you've described is something I hear with a regularity that has I like I no longer get goosebumps. Let me put it that way. Like it okay. is normal, like the number of podcast hosts that have seen owls the night before or some prescient moment the first email exchange or some some moment yeah. usually the night before the the or or the or or right after the, yeah. the podcast they'll get back to me right away and they'll say like oh just after then we hung up on the phone i walked outside there was an owl that's very common yeah. um so the no, the amount of times i've heard this is just like i want to be really careful putting a number on it but i'll say yeah, yeah half the people I, I do podcasts all the time i just basically say yes to people and that's a wonderful way to 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 try to promote a book and such but it's i enjoy them enormously doing having the chance to talk about this work but yeah. um i would say half the podcast hosts i talk with have had exactly that is absolutely the experience. amazing half i may be <laughs> wrong but it's how, i can't figure out how to parse it out but it's enough that it's like what you said is totally normal one guy contacted me his name is juan he hosts a site called his podcast is called one on one and and he was at his house in the backyard he's got a little son i think his son is like six or something his son is young and he it was the night before that we were going to talk and he was like i'm going to talk to the owl guy tonight and it's dark out in his backyard he says i wonder if i'll see an owl and as he has this thought his son goes dad look and a floating orange orb passed through the backyard Wow. So, so this is this is the this is part of my. If you just read the book, you you recognize what I'm talking about, where owls and the UFO thing get mixed up. Yeah, like, exactly right. And sick. whether it's a screen memory or whether or not, I mean, there's some like oftentimes people are really seeing an owl. Sometimes it's uh, ambiguous which one it is. Um, yeah. And a minute ago, you were you had said you know um, you had the epiphany when you were in, in the mountains where it was like this has something to do with UFOs. Are they the same thing or are they, I mean, what are your thoughts on what it is and what the owl is trying to communicate in its interactions with the, you know, human beings in this way? Well, they're not the same thing. Okay. Right. But, That's, yeah. but, but I would say they hold the same 
psychic charge mm-hmm. right so yeah and i would include synchronicity in that the title of my book it was not out by accident i put synchronicity synchronicity right on the cover of the messengers so it's owls synchronicity and ufo contact i yeah. put ufo abductee they are not the same thing they all hold the same emotionally charged influence over over the individual right so you can have a powerful synchronicity it can change your life you can have a powerful ufo experience it can change your life you can have a powerful owl sighting and it can change your life i've talked to many people who've had owl sightings that have changed your life lots of stories i have lots of stories i could go on and on but lots of stories about some there's no ufo in this context Mm -hmm. but people are driving down the road an owl flies lands on the road er, they have to come to a complete stop or they have to slow down or they have to get go around this thing so they've slowed down on this dark lonely road at night as they're stopped a car comes around the corner zooms around the corner passing into their lane if they had been if they hadn't stopped for the owl they would have had a head-on collision yeah your book talks about some of that and then where yeah. they're driving along and they're going at a high speed and the owl seems to pace their car at uh, you know highway speeds or whatever and it's well, like actually, not even really flapping it's, it's yeah like so so like right so if you're driving in a car you're driving forward the owl should be flying forward maybe it can look sideways at you but that's yeah. not what some this is one story this guy joe what he was and then the owl would be facing like flapping its wings but flying sideways like it's it, it doesn't match normal reality yeah those events i'm i put into the to the category of screen memory or some sort of projected influence on the mind of the observer but but those they're so bizarre they're so strange it's like dream logic it's like nightmare logic it's not it's not normal reality logic at all yeah so that's what's showing up in this and you even said it you you know you said um you know that the term i like to use is dream logic for this kind of like where you where you take like dreams have their own vibe, have their own narrative, have their own flow. And oftentimes these owl sightings turn into that. Like what your example, here, let me just say one thing about your sighting. Owls are very highly evolved, very highly attuned to their environment. They know they can fly silently. So it is, this is something I've experienced many times. I've seen a lot of owls. I live in places with a lot of owls. So it's, it's not that unusual, but I've seen a lot of owls. So owls, when you, you can look at an owl, they'll lock eyes with you. Mm-hmm. And then if you glance away, the owl will take that moment to fly off. They don't make any noise when they fly off. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very commonly reported. I've had many people say it. So the, I'm, I, I would love to talk to an owl biologist about this exact thing. I guess I could just find one and ask. But um, this is something that I recognize as a pattern. And I think that the owls must know it. Cats and yeah. stuff can do that too. Sometimes if a cat's in the room, you can turn away and then they'll look back. They know what it means to make eye contact with something. And they know what it means to sneak out stealthily. So yeah. the owl, I had an experience here. I'm just going to, so here's a story. I'm going to just jump into a story. Please. My partner, yeah, no, that's my what partner I want. Andrea at the time, uh, this would have been back in around 2007 or eight, excuse me, 2017 or 18, forgive me, around 2017 or 18, we were in the front of the house we were living in in upstate new york and she had come home from work and she saw an owl she said come out here and look at this owl and so i went out and looked at the owl with her and it was a snowy day and she was it was really funny because she was parked in a spot she normally wouldn't park someone else was in another parking spot we shared the, the driveway with another house and so she the only reason she saw it was because she was in this other, there was a beautiful barred owl on a low branch it was kind of on a hill so the tree was here if it goes downhill so it's kind of at our eye level and it was just gorgeous and so we sat and watched it and i'm standing above her and i brought my camera out because she texted me come out there's an owl so i brought my camera out so i'm taking pictures of this owl and then she says uh-oh something weird is happening and I'm taking pictures of owls. She describes this owl having a magenta halo around it and sort of projecting this magenta light and sort of she felt like the time stopped. And I'm I'm right, I'm above her, right? I'm a little taller than her. So I was taking camera pictures from her point of view right above. Nothing in the pictures, nothing at all. She was describing this absolutely mystical experience, which I've heard other people describe. And I trust her. She was right there. She's yeah. so so and then there came a point when it was kind of like. We were like, wow, that was really great. We kind of looked at each other a little bit and like, that's amazing. I and mean, this is a really cool experience. We looked back and the owl was gone. And then she said, well, she said, and I quickly agreed. She said, oh, I wish I could have seen it fly off. 
Now, owls have very good hearing, so if it flew off, it would have heard us. I'm saying that. So the next morning, we go out and, or excuse me, the next morning, she goes out to, to drive her son to, to school. And she says, come out, come out, come out, come quick, quick, the owl's here. A bit's back. It was in the same exact branch. She was standing in the same spot. <laughs> the owl was in the same branch. We looked at it. As soon as I got out there, the owl kind of looked at me and flew off. And it was like, we asked here it. I am. We asked it last night. Yeah. We said, oh, I wish I could have seen it fly off. It, like it, there was no other way to interpret that than it heard us and it, and it said, sure, I can show you. I'll fly off for you. Yeah. So let me add, this, this story is connected to like 10 other synchronicities. One of them that is interesting is I had been trying to get a hold of a shaman named Sequoia Trueblood. He's a Native American out of, from Canada. Mm -hmm. And I had it, like I tried and tried to figure out a way to get a hold of him, and so I sent these messages. And he was associated with some college, and but he hadn't worked there in a long time. And and then I came back in the house after seeing the owl with with Andrea, and Sequoia Trueblood had returned my call. Which in the shamanism thing is completely a mesh. Yeah, I mentioned that mystery. in the intro. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it it seems like yeah. So that was screaming really at us to be to yeah. aware of that. Yeah. yeah. You know, in your book, you talk about several instances where people would come out of their house and they would just see the owl, like, you know, staring at the front door or out, you know, and it's like, I used to live on 10 acres of property. And I remember seeing um, a, uh, an owl that would fly over sometimes at night. Um, but it was never like twice in a row in the same place. That seems like an unnatural or remarkable behavior for a wild animal. Um, and so it's like, at what point, I mean, how do you read the behavior or are you are we even supposed to you know like sort of intellectually understand what it's trying to tell us how do you interpret these things because like you mentioned that you, you know you got a call back from the uh, true blood at, the, at that moment do you think a lot of these owl sightings or even the related synchronicities are pointing you in a particular direction or to tell you that you're on a, the oh, right oh, path yeah. with oh, what you're doing you yeah go, beep 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 ding ding yes it's telling me like for me it's like a compass you know, some mm -hmm. people say it's signs along synchronicities are signs along a path. Yeah. And that's that's a nice way to put it. A, the, a more a more nuanced way to say it, I think, is if you're on an open ocean and and it's a cloudy day, you cannot find your direction without a compass. Yeah. Right? You have to have a compass. So that's what I that's if you're on a path, you're already on a trajectory, you're already following this path. You get to a fork in the path, a synchronicity can tell you to go right or left, but the richness of this is much more like a, a compass on a cloudy day where you're dependent on it. So I have, for better or for worse, I have been trusting the synchronistic experiences in my life and, and trying to um, trying to follow those. So you asked, um, yeah, is it is it a sign along the path? And yes, it is. And then there's many ways to look at it, but trusting synchronicity, following synchronicity, um, synchronicities can be messy. They can be sloppy. You can make a mistake in your interpretation, but sure. that's the same thing you can do with a dream, right? So yeah. you can summon a dream. You can have a personal dream. You can tell your therapist, oh, this is my dream. The therapist can analyze it, but you, it's your experience. It's your subconscious. You can say, maybe, like it, may, it sounds like you're a little off base from my own deeper feeling. It feels true this way. So it's very tough to ask an outside source yeah. what may be happening in a personal thing. And Owls do actually sit on the same branches often because oh, okay. they're creatures of habit. So they'll hunt from on the same branches in the forest at night. So. Okay. So that's not necessarily something that's totally. Uh, but it's totally... interesting. I pay attention yeah. to it, but it's, that's, yeah, that if a branch, if an owl's on the same branch, that's not, you don't, don't read too much into that. Yeah. I'm reading a book by Jeremy Farber, the cosmic serpent, um, talking about shamanism. And uh, one of the things he's talking about was with Amazonian tribes, he's down there and they're taking ayahuasca and other hallucinogens and they enter another reality. And one of the things that he's uh, talking about and describing in this book is that a lot of their uh, ethnobotanical knowledge and information comes from uh, seemingly a higher sort of alien cosmic intelligence that they encounter within the realm of the ayahuascaros, right? Uh, basically the shamans who take the drug and venture forth. Um, I can't help but wonder if, if like for people who aren't, uh, who don't have the vehicle of ayahuasca or aren't doing shamanic dancing or, you know, other kinds of, other kinds of trance work, if this is a subtle way of that, uh, you know, intelligence reaching through the veil to nudge us this way or that way. And then you start to wonder, well, well, if that's the case, 
what are what is the intention of this intelligence you know so i, I mean using that as sort of a you know a lens what is your ontology that supports this or have you even gotten to that point or do you think about it that way like how do you interpret reality when these things are real and meaningful what's your vision of what's going on so so i'm going to use a metaphor which i don't think is true okay but i'm going to use it anyway so there's a, they're flying around they're flying saucers you know these little beings they're looking mm -hmm. out their window at earth you know they can scan our minds they can scan our tv they can look at our history backwards and forwards they have like the ability to like to see time differently and they can the, so my my sense is they can point to us and say these people are messed up yeah these people are off path these people are in trouble there's all okay, like there was a, i mean just simple nuclear pro proliferation is like like we're that's yeah. dangerous that's bad Big red flashing so they sign. see it they know it <laughs> and so what do they do like i mean it doesn't seem like they're tweaking the the leaders Right. You know, like they could in a, if a science fiction movie, they could put like a leader into the White House or something like that. I don't foresee that happening. Or I don't see that happening. What I do see is that a grassroots level, mm -hmm. the people are having these contact experiences as well as I'm, I'm going to say, I bet you a goodly percentage of the people who are taking ayahuasca ritually, therapeutically, would also fall into this character category that these people who are having owl and UFO experiences are becoming, they're not quite, some of them are becoming shamans outright. But what I can say is many of them are doing a shaman-like piece of work. This is something that appeared in my research since doing the book, The Messengers. When I, and I mention it, I talk about it in the book, but I like, it's wild, this. So I, when I talk to people, I, I just listen, I just wait. You know, people who have had an owl and a UFO experience. And then I just wait when I talk to them or if I'm exchanging emails or something, I'll wait and ask them at some point. It's like, hey, what do you do for work? And they'll say, not everyone, but enough that there's a significant pattern. They'll say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Reiki therapist. I'm doing Reiki healing. I would quantify Reiki as that's an that's a, it's a ancient uh, Japanese form of, of non-physical therapy like the, the person doesn't touch the, the the practitioner doesn't touch the patient they just mm -hmm. put, they either put their hands over usually it's their hands i i don't have a team of statisticians working for me i'm doing all of them. just <laughs> one person working alone so but i anecdotally i would say mm -hmm. that 50 percent of the people who have had a shared out or have had an owl and ufo experience co-joined 50 percent of those people are reiki healers wow that I'll tell you, 50% of the normal population isn't a Reiki healer. So you ask, what's the what's the overall big picture? Yeah. Like why, what's what's the purpose of the owl and UFO thing? I, I am cautiously speculating because I'm just riffing off of yeah. off of like what I want to be true. That doesn't make it, that doesn't mean it's true. But <laughs> what I could I can I can wrap my mind around what might be true is that these some outside intelligence is seeding our population with people who are doing shamanic type work yeah. I, I feel I, can, I feel like i can say that without i feel like i can say that with a with a it's hard to say it's not true in essence because i can't back it up but wow it sure plays out as true given all the reports i've received yeah you know it also sort of uh i mean it could kick off that process too right like i read in your book about how the spiritual you know development seems to it was either in your book or the talk that you sent me um one of the two where you were saying that this often kicks off like a, a spiritual transformation for some folks mm -hmm. um and yeah. that's and matthew roberts uh the experiencer he wrote a book called initiated and um his whole take is that basically the ufo experience he actually just had an nhi experience not directly a ufo contact but um that it initiated him into this process of transformation and that he thinks that that's largely what it's trying to do is raise our uh you know sort of the average global uh consciousness level so that we can progress as a species and like you said get to a place where you know when they drive by they're not seeing a three alarm fire maybe they can stop or something you know along those lines where we're worth yeah, yeah, we're yeah, more yeah. worthy of contact at that point exactly yeah so so yes that model i totally tap into that i i it's very common i've actually that's one that gets funny you do this stuff and these patterns emerge and you're like this is a wild 
piece of pat this is is this true can i and then I'll, i i know a lot of people in the field so i can actually ask other people like do you know preston dennett yeah i've had him on yeah, my so, show oh yeah yeah so Pres i asked him like i was like listen am i talking out of my hat I, i'm saying people who have ufo experiences in in my opinion it's co-joined ufo and owl experiences are they having a spiritual awakening like i'm saying they're having a spiritual awakening as part of this and he's like oh yeah oh it's right there it's right there and he's done more research he's done more pragmatic research than i have done i have done a very focused myopic kind of research where i'm looking at just this thin sliver of the great big giant volume of ufo data i'm just looking at the owl and ufo thing and i'm pulling in the thinnest little thread it has proved so heartening that this that this little corner of the ufo field is so rich in its mythic power yeah well that's what's i mean what i like about your work is that it's it's exchanged breadth for depth like you really get into this topic in a deep way and relate a lot of stories and uh, the other thing that i really appreciate about your work and you say this early on in the book is that you trust people to be telling you the truth like you don't spend time quibbling over like well can i verify every last element of a particular mm -hmm. story if someone has a story that means something to them and they share it with you you trust that to um you you, you trust that and i find that really powerful in this topic uh, not to say that we shouldn't be critical thinkers but it's the experience anyway that that matters and if the experience is what's transforming people their experience of that moment is the definitive thing and having that level of trust i think that we've all gotten in this uh place partly because of you know physical materialism or whatever else interior experiences are discounted like you know we never want to mm. uh, value those because they're not quantifiable you can't put it on a you know spreadsheet it's not something that you can do meta analysis on or whatever else and um i think that reinvesting those sorts of personal stories with uh, the power that they imbued on with that particular person i, th I think that is a uh, a great thing <laughs> basically well, you just said about trusting the experience. Yeah, yeah, that's so I um I spoke with someone and kind of well, he got a hold of me. Guy kind of calls me up. He's another researcher. And he's like, Mike, your work drives me crazy. It's making me crazy. And it's like, and it's like, oh, what's up? And he's like, your work is not scientific. And I thought for a second, it's like, what do I care? I'm not a scientist, exactly. which I thought was a really good comeback. So but yeah. I'm not a scientist. I'm not beholden to the scientific method. I don't know how you would use the scientific method to to analyze this stuff. I guess you could do statistical analysis. Statistical analysis. Away. Yeah, meta-analysis of details and whatnot. But that's yeah, about so it. Yeah, so I'm looking for patterns, right? So if there's a one-off, if I have a story that sits alone as a one-off, I have to say that. I feel like I'm obligated to say this story is a one-off. There's a couple stories in the book, The Messengers, that were one-offs. I said it, and then I have since gotten more accounts since that book came out nine years ago. And so they are no longer statistically alone. I don't think the other people were influenced by the book and made stuff up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there's a woman, this is a woman we're like, we're, she's Facebook friends. Her and her husband, they show me pictures of her cats and like the roller skating pictures and stuff. So it's like a real person. She's funny and smart. And, but she had an experience. Oh, this is interesting. She had an experience where, like, this is, I, in fact, when sometimes I'll, I'll do talk, some kind of, I'm from New York City. I don't. I don't like. I don't like to get backed into a corner. And if I do, all like, so so like a podcast host was very very formal in his like he was like not buying my stuff at all. And instead of me carefully going step by step by step, I I'm that you'll know a little bit about my personality. I just jump to the weirdest stories. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, well here's a story for you. Well, here I'll tell you this story. And yeah. I told him the weirdest one of the so I got a lot of weird stories in my files and. And so this woman, Jessica, is lying in her bed. She's kind of like in this, she says it right up. She's I'm in that halfway place between sleep and wake. And I'm in that sort of mystical netherworld between the two. And I look out the window and there's an owl on a branch. And it's looking at me. And a, and a blue laser beam comes down from space and hits the owl in its head. And then bzz, a blue laser beam shoots out of the owl's third eye and connects with my third eye. Whoosh, and I was flooded with this totality of knowing, with this absolute certainty that I understood everything in the universe. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. So I can, I've heard similar stories to that. So I feel I have no problem sharing Jessica's story. 
Yeah. I mean, I just tell it exactly. She wrote it. She shared it to me in an email. We went back and forth, corresponded. I like said, here's what I want to write. She said, that's, a, that's very accurate. So the thing with, oh my, the thing with Andrea in the yard, I was standing right next to her. Mm -hmm. It was like, this is not a, this is not a, this is someone I trust implicitly. She has a mystical experience. Like looking at the owl, the same owl. I'm, I didn't have the mystical experience. She said it. It was. It was surrounded by a ma magenta halo, and it was. And she felt. Andrea felt she was given a download. Yeah. This Jessica's story and Andrea's story arrived essentially simultaneous. So here's here's like someone I trust has the experience. She's narrating her experience that I can't see as it's happening. Jessica tells me a very similar story where this owl was projecting a blue beam. Andrea said the owl was in a magenta halo. It's not exact, but it's similar enough. And then the, in the aftermath, the many synchronicities that became entangled involved both Jessica and Andrea. So this is, this is what, these are the these are the threads I'm, I want to pull on this. This is the kind of stuff that just that I love as a researcher when these things get tangled up like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are intimidated by that, um, but I think that that's probably the richest vein for us to figure out whatever meaning we're supposed to draw from this stuff. Uh, and that's uh, I think, you know. It's it's interesting when you have discussions with people who aren't uh, open to this kind of stuff, how um, you know, I'm a journalist by day. I have a regular uh, newscast that I do, and uh, it's challenging at times to explain to people who aren't necessarily into this how how I judge the veracity of people's stories. But I, I feel like I can get a sense of when someone's making something up or 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 not. But I think that the the fact that these experiences often transform people's lives in a dramatic way um, test is a testimony to their truthfulness and to the actual actuality of that particular occurrence. And I hear, I mean, I've talked to lots of people now and um, their stories seem to line up and confirm each other, even though they're oftentimes as surreal as you can possibly imagine what they draw from it and what they, um, you know, it's all part of a, like you said, a pattern. And it starts to come to the surface, even though the tales are rationally ridiculous. I think that that's, part of the whole look at me part of it you know what i mean like if it's just a normal uh, situation or a normal experience we're not going to stop and consider what it meant but if it's something that stands outside the the normal realms of our reality then we're forced to to reckon with it at least on an individual basis you know that's this is kind of the nuts and bolts versus the consciousness i mean the love and light is kind of a little more flowery way to say it but there's two there's two and they it's oil and vinegar they don't mix you know yeah. and I, which is a shit i try to 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 be it's funny i but i i used to go to ufo conferences before i started talking myself before my book came out i went to a lot of ufo conferences really rewarding for me to be able to enter a room where i am in my tribe essentially where i can like you can turn to someone at a ufo conference and say so what brings you here and they, they have they got it they're allowed to say i had this powerful experience that, yeah. that went on this this and this and they can tell you the story they might not tell you that story at the at like the family reunion or exactly at, you know, yeah, yeah. at the bank yeah so what i'm finding is that that, that the material the now this is a this, uh, this is a very rough caricature okay men want to study aircraft carriers and Navy jet pilots and Tic Tac looking things and government documents. Women want to give themselves over to the consciousness aspect to it, to the dream language of it, to the mystery of it, to the, to the, to the subtleties of the strangeness. That's an unfair little caricature, but it's, it's sort of true. And I, at the time, like I, I would go to these conferences and I would wear a, I would dress nice. I had short hair. I had no, there was no red flags about my, my presence, appearance, yeah. my appearance. Yeah. So there, so I could talk to everyone. I could talk to the guys doing UFO research and in, and like, which is very interesting, all the government documents and the, and the military overlap and you know, what the government knows and isn't telling us. And, and then I could walk to the women and they're all dressed in their flowy linen dresses and their turquoise earrings. And they're talking about channeling and, and dream messages and, and their star brothers and sisters and stuff like that. 
uh, is I had the little tag that said speaker. You would look up at the in the in the when I the first time I spoke, and I was the owl guy. I was talking about the overlap between owls as as flighty and dismissible as anything could be in the eyes of the of the materialists. Yeah, and I was shunned. Like I was like. I was like, you know, the guys who were doing the, the, the materialist stuff would read my name and knew who I was. And they were just like, whoosh, like, wouldn't interact with me at all. That's a little bit. There was some certainly would, but, but I recognized it immediately that I was, that there was this divide. Yeah. Do you think that's still true? Because there, there seems like there are people who were nuts and bolts who've acknowledged that there is a consciousness mm -hmm. element to it now. Do you think that we've grown beyond that? And what, what would you say contributes to that? Well, perhaps on an individual level, well, there's lots of examples I could say where we grew beyond that. We've grown. Uh, Grant Cameron is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then, uh, and Richard Dolan, who's a very pragmatic materialistic researcher, was the original publisher of my first book, and he that's that was like he he was well aware that there was this consciousness element, you know, woven into the mystery, and and so he was very eager to publish my book when it when I sent him the manuscript because. Well, he felt like he simply had to address that aspect of it. And by publishing that book, he, I don't want to put, that's the way it played out. And, it, it, you know, so he was, but I would say that since the New York Times article came out in 2017, and there's been a heavy focus on, on the government and the military and what Congress knows and what the Pentagon knows and, and what the Navy jet pilots are saying in their testimony and, and kind of grainy, crappy video footage of a little polka dot flying across the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm the, the, the overall public sphere, like the, the, the stuff that rose to the surface and broke out and is now influencing the majority of the public as, it's, as the UFO presence is not the consciousness stuff it is the the you know like people in suits at a congressional hearing every once in yeah. a while there's little sparks and little things there that tells me they are well aware of the weirdness in yeah. this subject yeah. um but but it's it's what i refer to as above the waterline and below the waterline and yeah. and and since 2017 in the new york times article that above the waterline thing has taken over especially in you know, social media and Twitter and stuff like that. But it is, yeah. it is, they are, I don't care what I say here, but I mean, there is a big percentage of the people who are researching this, who are making a conscious decision not to address the weirder aspects. They're all aware of it. Anyone who's dipped their toe into this mystery is aware of that conscious, of the, yeah, of the, right. let's say just the owls, but they're not addressing it. Yeah, I mean, how could you not be aware of it, first off? And then not addressing it, it seems to me that there is a, uh, you know, once you're initiated into the into the topic and you've accepted the concrete reality of UFOs, which I think if you look at the literature and the evidence, you can't help but do eventually. I mean, I really think that if you honestly engage with all of the evidence, you have to at least accept the possibility that they were being visited by something. But that's one threshold, one level of belief. And then to get to a level where not only are they coming and visiting us, but they possibly can manipulate our consciousness. They can make us see things that maybe aren't there or are only in our minds. Lots of weird consciousness related things like that. That's a further stretch that if we talk about that, there might, for some people, there's a fear that will push them away before we ever get them through the door, which, uh, you know, I, I can understand that. But for my own self, like I started with the physical UFO stuff, the Tic Tac story, uh, the 2017 stuff that was right around the time that I got into it. I read Leslie Kane's book uh, and um, fell into the topic. But I find myself being more and more drawn to the spiritual elements of it and how there is this like um, spiritual or consciousness evolution that seems to be propelled by sightings and experiences of the like. And that's the part that and the philosophical ramifications of that that really uh, light my fire, I guess. And um, I think for a lot of people, you know, um, further exposure to this topic could further or could, um, you know, produce more curiosity about that sort of thing and hopefully help us all, you know, transcend the current moment, which is abysmal, as we all know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's a logic to say, oh, you need to take baby steps. And I'm not interested in baby steps. Like, I right. would, if I tell my story to take baby steps, 
I would have had to tell a completely dull story in the book, The Messengers, yeah, nine years ago, and then I would have to seed it and make it like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm telling the story as clearly and forcefully as I can, and and I can't. I, I tried to I tried to write that book in a way that was accessible, accessible to the to 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 hardcore researchers as well as to someone who just picked the book up off just out of curiosity. I tried to make it accessible, but like I am not beholden to holding anyone's hand and tiptoeing down the path and and coddling them. That's not I'm from New York City. That's not in me at all. You know? <laughs> well, and I think that if you get caught in a situation where you're telling one story because you want to reach people and then later on you're like, oh, but that story also had other elements of it, then you're undermining yourself. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like come out with the story, tell the facts as you experience them and let people deal with that reality. And I think that we've all kind of gotten in the habit of like trying to make ourselves look good in our presentation. And that just makes us seem like we're dissembling, you know, or we're we're making things up on the fly. So I think you know, your approach was uh, well done to be upfront and be bold about it. And I think that's liberating for people who've had similar experiences. You know, they start to feel like they have permission to engage. Do you mind if I ask about your own spiritual sure. like beliefs in terms of how it relates to UFOs and what, how those experiences have informed your personal um, spiritual journey? If you have one. Oh yeah, well I've had, certainly had a spiritual journey. Like I definitely felt like so so. But and I say it in my talks. I say it right in the book. Um, between two thousand and six, where the event I had with Kristen in the in the mountains, we're seeing the owls. Starting then, and then going to it's kind of fuzzy where I kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit. But to two thousand and thirteen, the final part of the book, there's a thing called the, my confirmation event. It's the last chapter of the of the messengers. But it's a it's a long chapter. It's like thirty pages of me telling an interwoven set of stories, which I call my confirmation event, which happened in March of two thousand and thirteen, which was eleven years ago. And uh, so, between two thousand and six and two thousand and thirteen, which is seven years, I I, I spent ninety five percent of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane. After the initial event with Kristen, I was hit with so many synchronicities that I was I was just throttled. And then when I had the confirmation event, which I'm happy to talk about, it's hard to talk about quickly. It's complex. It's a complex story, but um, or a complex set of stories. In those years leading up to that, I was a mess. And I'll tell you, like my old life crumbled, and a new life was slowly emerging. And when I had the confirmation event, which was essentially seeing, I had an, a, an event that took place uh, sleeping out under the stars in Southern Utah. And to tell that story properly, like at the end of that event, like I, I had a psychic vision that connected it to two other events on a map in a straight line. And when that happened, like there was, I was just like so floored and and I, and I just had to cry uncle. I was just like, okay, I give up. It's true. It's real. I'm not going to struggle with this. I'm not going to fight it. Before that, I was like, I believe there's a phenomenon, a UFO phenomenon. It does not involve me. I am not going there. It can't, like, I was pushing, pushing, pushing back. I was in fully denying my own involvement in this. And then after that, I was like, oh, this is real. What it did was the tape loop in my head that had been playing relentlessly for seven years was saying, this can't be true. This can't happen to you. This isn't real. This can't be true. This can't happen to you. It was just on and on. That tape loop got disengaged, pulled out of my brain and thrown away. It was gone. So I never had that doubt anymore. But yeah. I mean, still life was challenging and I had to like make sense of mysteries and stuff like that. But I was no longer plagued with, is this real? I was totally aware that this is a this is a real phenomenon. What that reality is, is anyone's guess. It's very elusive. I could speculate any number of directions. I could actually speculate pretty well in any number of directions. Doesn't mean I know. So you're asking about my spirituality. What I yeah. feel like I can say is psychic stuff has happened to me. That's so profound that I, that like when people say, oh, I, I'm a psychic. I, I had a UFO experience and then I became a psychic. Like, yep, got it. I'm there. I got a weird animal it's not just owls it's like other animals too hawks i was going to ask you that also because i had oh, yeah. this 
strange uh, incident with a deer where oh, it deer was running was alongside deer. my car and made oh, eye contact with me and it was like going i mean i wasn't going that fast but it was going like probably 15 miles an hour 550 no no 15 okay yeah, okay <laughs> yeah but uh and i was pulling up to a stop sign but it ran alongside and it was like this weird you mentioned in the book the oz factor you mm-hmm. know it's like this weird moment that's outside of everything else where i'm like communing with this animal and it was wild and it was just anyway that's was a powerful well, experience so i was going to ask you about that it's interesting yeah there's a there's a story with alan cavanis in that book which is very similar to to that yeah book. i remember you mentioning that yeah yeah so that's an, and then that that story is retold much more in depth in my second book which is called stories from the messengers um so yeah so my spirituality is like like i'm open to my second book has got the subtitle um accounts of owls ufos and a deeper reality that would be what that would be my spirituality there is a deeper reality that is running parallel to us that is overlapping with our reality my very strong sense is i can't know this for sure but my very strong sense is that there is another intelligence Mm -hmm. inhabiting that parallel reality that intelligence they can look into our reality with ease yeah we cannot look into their reality with ease we can get a glimpse of it we can maybe meditate or maybe get a fleeting glimpse of something or a fleeting knowing of something or ayahuasca or one of those or ayahuasca I mean, there's lots or, of methods but yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or or ufo abduction or there's mm-hmm. lots of methods yeah yeah so um so that would be my that would be my spirituality we are not alone this physical reality that we you know that we the the desk is solid yes but there's a mystery why my hand doesn't pass right through the molecules of the desk yeah. so so we are sharing our reality with something call it god call it the gods call it the our spirit guides call, there's any number of vocabulary words they're all nice they all have their limitations but but i know what people are trying to express when they say god when they say my my guardian angel i know what they're trying to express and i believe yeah. it Truly you, can you talk a little bit about the connection with death? Oh, gosh. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. So I mean, because you talk about the other world, and I think that a lot of people sometimes wonder if if that is indeed what it is or how it relates. Just what are, what are your thoughts on that? So, so, so the transformative process, right? So the owl mm-hmm. is symbolic of the transformative process. Death is the ultimate transformation. We're all, it's a one-way road for all of us. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you, you know, you add a little bit, that's an, it's a, you're going to, we're going to come back. So I believe in reincarnation in some form or another. It's not a given that everyone gets reincarnated, but but I, wow, I, I trust that as a, even if it's only a metaphor, right? You meet yeah. someone at a party or like good buddies right off the bat and it's like, hey, we must've met in a different life. You can say that doesn't mean you literally believe it, but wow, everyone knows what that means. So yeah. um, I wasn't, so here, I'll tell a story. My mom died in 2013. I, she was, she was in her early eighties. She had been suffering terribly from Alzheimer's for the last few years of her life. It was horribly sad. And, and I was on one side of the bed. My sister was on the other side of the bed when she passed, we were both holding her hand. It was a really powerful experience in the sense that it was like, Oh, like I recognized right away. Like I am not like, this is a human experience. Humans all throughout the grand history of of humanity have had this experience many many people before me have had this experience it was remarkably powerful and and i was immersed in the owl research at that point in my life my sister was living in north carolina my mom was staying at a hospice care unit just down the road from my sister my sister was doing a lot of care for my mother in the final years and so my brother was there in town he wasn't in the room with us so it's me my brother and sisters the only siblings once one brother one sister and it was about three in the morning when my mom passed and it was just like the next day was just a mess we were all trying to sleep we were all trying to plan obituaries and funerals and calls and relatives and yeah and and i knew there was going to be like some owl thing is going to show up now i my brother and sister knew were well aware that i was doing this owl research they had no idea what we, where i was coming from i would get up in the morning and drink <laughs> coffee with my sister and i would go kind of like have my laptop at her desk and I'm like here let me read you this letter that came in this morning and i'd read a letter and here's one that came in five minutes ago when i'd read a letter and she was baffled she was just <laughs> baffled. You know what so where that night the same day as my mother died three in the morning that evening we're on the back porch, drinking a glass of wine. My sister lives in the south. It's like springtime. It's warm. It's big trees. And and my sister's neighbor, Ruthie, 
who is a wonderful, well, you want to talk about a perfect witness. Mm -hmm. You want someone on a documentary that's going to make their case and everyone's going to believe it. This is Ruthie. Very proper, very Southern, very sweet. She's my sister's best friend. She's sitting across from us. I'm on a couch with my brother and sister. I'm in the middle. Jean's on one side, Jim's on the other. And Ruthie says, Jim, Jean, Mike, I know there is an afterlife. And I know because of an owl. And when she said that, my brother that gave me this so look. That is so bizarre. My brother gave me this look. Like he looked at me like, 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 did you put her up to this? Like, right? What's going on, Mike? Did you do yeah. this? And he, you could just see him kind of like, mm, he was bristling. And my sister Jeannie literally went, oh, no, owls, owls. No, 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 no. <laughs> and, and poor Ruthie was like, what did I, what did I just say? <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, well, Ruthie, like, you don't know it, but I've been immersed in this owl research. And... and <laughs> And I want to hear your story. This owl research, owls are connected to powerful mythic and mystical experiences. I've This is the avenue of my research. I think I might have even said UFOs. And though I'm cautious to say that, that's dropping the bomb sometimes. And, but so, so I want to hear your story. So she told the story to my brother, sister, and I. She said, my daddy died. When my daddy died, I was grieving terribly. And I would walk the nature trail around the neighborhood. This is the neighborhood I was in. I would walk the dog with my sister on this nature trail. We would walk, I would walk the nature trail every day as a way to come to terms with the grieving. And every day I would pass an owl. And then there came a day when I was approaching where the owl would, was sitting and it hooted at me. And I walked right up to this owl and I looked at it and I said, are you my daddy? <laughs> and at that moment, all my grieving disappeared. And she said, I felt so blessed that such a beautiful animal could be the messenger for my daddy. And now I know he is in heaven. Wow. So I didn't have, no one needed to convince me of owls and their mystical power. But my brother and sister never looked at me the same way again. I bet. I mean, how does something like that not like, you know, rock your worldview? I mean, I guess if you're closed off to it, but how did she react when you told her that you were doing research on owls? Did she, she remark about that? She was wonderful. She was totally gracious. It was a little yeah. bit of work. She was kind of like, I'll say, like, can you, can you write your story out? And I, or, and she was, it took a little bit and I had to ask a few times, but she, yeah. she wrote a beautiful little essay and, and she's one of the people, this is very interesting. She's one of the people of the many that would send me letters and they would say, oh, the owl was on the fence. And I like had felt this knowing from the owl and it was this mystical connection with this owl. And, and then they will stop calling it an owl and they'll call it the messenger. So I was looking at the messenger on the fence post and, and, and that's where the title of the book came from. And if Ruthie yeah. did it, I didn't, there was no title to the book at that point. I was doing research. I knew I was gonna do something with this research. Yeah. I, it was before I knew I was gonna write a book. Yeah. Um, and, and so Ruthie, called it the messenger which is a beautiful i mean you could call ravens messengers and such so there's plenty of animals that have a sim, symbolically can be seen as messengers but but wow the owl is a highly charged totem it is and i mean at this point uh i think that i don't know if it's because of the knowledge that i have from this subject and things that i've read and encountered here but i mean to me messenger is an owl i mean it's like whether it's life and death whether it's a uh, harbinger of doom or whatever people talk about from the from, you know days gone past or whatever uh the owl is the perfect messenger i can't i can't put that name on something else's and have it stick as well so, so good title so, <laughs> yeah so so the owl is so the mythology of the owl and um do you know who Jordan Maxwell was? He died a couple of years ago. I've heard the name, but I can't. Yeah, I don't, I don't so, know. so Jordan Maxwell is a mythologist, and he was he's a really interesting character. But he died a couple of years ago. He was in his late seventies, I think. And I um, Jordan Maxwell. Oh, he's a, he's a really interesting guy. Yeah. And there was a whole Gaia TV series that where they interviewed him, and really, really remarkable character. He has lots of podcasts online and stuff, but um. He did a podcast and I, and he said, I'm going to give out my personal phone number. And the host was like, you don't have to do that. And he's like, I'm going to do it. So I gave it and I wrote it down. I'm like, Bing, I called him right away. I'm like, hello. My, and I'm like, okay. And he's like, who are you? And it's like, well, I'm just like, why did you call me? And it's like, you gave your number. I'm like, when did I, what? And so I was like, oh, I was super intimidated. And so I was like, ooh, ooh, I got to ask before. Yeah, I wasn't going to let him off the phone. Like I'm from New York city. Like I wasn't going to let this guy off the phone. So I was like, before you go, ooh, ooh, 
like I'm doing research into owls. What's the source of the owl mythology? And he just said, the owls fly into the forest at night. The owls fly into the forest at night. They fly in perfect darkness. And that must have seemed remarkable to ancient man. Yeah. That would have been magical to ancient man. Present day man, you know, we're, we're in this Western society. We can say the owls fly in, in total darkness and they have highly evolved, you know, sight that has, that has through the evolutionary process that allows them to pick up on minuscule amounts of light that are, that are, that we cannot perceive. Yeah. But that's not what ancient man thought. The ma ancient man would have said the owls are magic. Yeah. So the owls fly into the dark. They fly through the forest at night, through the trees, complete darkness. Ancient man would have understood this well. It doesn't take much. That becomes a metaphor for flying to the land of the dead, for flying yeah. to the land of the answers. The next step of that is the owl has to return with a message. So they yeah. fly to the land of the gods. They fly to the land of the ancestors. They fly into that other realm and they return with a message. Now, that's ancient mythology. Let's look at present day mythology. We have Harry Potter, the most popular series yes. of books in the history of publication. Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It's perfect. It is perfect. It is the owl as messenger right now, present day. I don't know whether J.K. Rowling knew this or not, or whether she just like it was a nice visual. Yeah, thing I mean, she... and they and they're bearing an invitation to a magical world. <laughs> like yes, the owls exactly. show up and they're dropping off an invitation saying you're going to Hogwarts, which is all of a sudden you've you've been initiated into this uh, realm that you didn't know existed. You know, so exactly. it's like, yeah. So so it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. And my hope is, I would love to ask her, I can't, I don't know how to get it for gatekeepers would never, fly, yeah, I get it. but I would love to ask her, like, did you know the ancient mythology of the owl before writing this passage? I would love it if it just welled up out of the ether in her imagination and her creative work. That would be wonderful. It's still remarkable. But if she, if she, you know, just picked it because it matched. Now, um, JK Rowling has, Rowling has owl, O-W-L, right in her name. That, that means That's nothing. But it is the no, but it is an interesting, yeah. yeah. It's another one of those uh, interesting synchronistic, you know, facts. Here, that... Let me do one little thing. I have to do this because I've been trying to make this case lately. So there are five things mm -hmm. that are five modalities that that the owl is connected to. So one is UFO contact, mm -hmm. right? So a big fat book, four big fat books on UFO contact in owls, and then I would also say death. Owls and death. I just told the death story. Yeah. Owls and meditation, very common. There's a whole chapter in the book on meditation. Very yeah. common that people will meditate and that an owl will appear as they are rising up out of their, as they open their eyes, essentially. They'll be open their eyes and there'll be an owl right on the inline of their site. Lots of stories. Owls and psychedelics, most particularly mushrooms, very common. Very common. It's funny. I, 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 had this like i got a few accounts of owls and lsd and i've got one account of owls and ayahuasca it's not in a fur pattern but it's i'm waiting i'm sure there's other stories out there but i've only got one of owls and ayahuasca um and then owls and the shamanic initiation yeah when someone is initiated into the shamanic practice becoming the the village shaman it is well understood in the community of shamans. I asked Sequoia Trueblood this. He was straight up. He's like, oh, pff, it's all over. Owls are all over this, this shamanism thing. So when someone's being initiated, owls will appear in their lives. Now, when there's five things. There might be more. This is simply the pattern I've got. For instance, I, in the near-death experience, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't that seem like, well, that would fit, but doesn't. I got no evidence. I got no reports of owls in the near-death experience. They might yeah. be out there. I just simply don't have them. But so, yeah. and so these five modalities. So, so I'm saying that these, the owl is connected to these highly charged human experiences of which UFO, a UFO contact is certainly a highly charged human experience as is shamanic initiation and meditation and psychedelics and death. Those are all highly charged events that have the power to transform. You look at that list, it's a very mystical, ethereal set of 
human experiences, the, that is what the owl is connected to. What's interesting about what you just said, among other things, is that Ray Hernandez, do you know who he is? Oh, yeah, very well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had him on the show, and we were talking about the contact modalities, and you just named them. I mean, you pulled he, near-death experiences out of it. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it, they are, when you talk about this realm that may exist that is uh, above ours or below ours, somehow coupled with ours, that we have limited access to, but they can perceive ours, I think that the owls seem to be the gatekeepers or uh, around the, the yeah, exactly right. I mean, and that's an interesting way to sort of contextualize yourself when you have an experience and you have, you see an owl, I think that that could, you know, potentially mean something deeper. So I made the list in the book, The Messengers that came out in 2015. After the book came out, Ray Hernandez came out with something and I'm, I would love to know when the day was, I could ask him, but, but so, so do you know how Ray Hernandez got the modalities? The list of modalities um i don't know if we got into that particular question so, it's a wonderful story yeah so i got i got no problem telling his story for him i do this for people <laughs> all the time so he's driving through traffic he's in mm -hmm. miami he's driving in miami traffic he's making a left turn it's npr is on the radio they're doing a news story and he's listening to the radio and then he's making a left turn he's halfway through the left turn and whoosh, he's gone he's just out He's in some other reality totally. And he is floating in this kind of, it just seems like computer generated animation almost. He's floating in next to this giant Ferris wheel, this huge iron wheel, like with spokes, big giant Ferris wheel spokes. And, and one spoke passes him and it says UFO contact on the arm of the metal thing. And then the next one comes along and it says the near death experience. And the next one comes along and it says shamanic journeying. And the next one says, I can't remember, like mystical meditation. He's got though his list of modalities is he's got about nine things. I have five things. Okay. So, and, and so I, I took those from the research I've been getting. He had it through a psychic vision. So yeah. with these things and nine things appear and they're, they're meditation and just, dreams dreams mm -hmm. is one of the things and so and then and then as this big giant wheel is turning he gets sucked into the axle into the hub right the hub is where every spoke is joined and he he goes to that hub and it says human consciousness and then he's back in traffic it's a, the same story he's been gone for 20 minutes but he's like yeah. finishing the left turn in traffic yeah. it's a remarkable wow. story yeah, his whole, I mean, I, he mentioned something briefly about having an experience in traffic. I didn't know about the Ferris wheel and all of that. And that's remarkable. I, I probably can't even, got a little bit of that wrong, but I bet you I did pretty well. So Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the people having these visionary experiences and the world just wants to pretend it's all it's all not real. That's what our job is, I guess, is to convince people or There's a deeper these. reality. Yes, exactly right. There's and a, what do we do with that? There's a parallel reality. Yeah, what do we do with that? Yeah. Exactly. So what it, one thing you can do is if someone says, oh, a guy had a psychic experience, don't roll your eyes. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> lots of people are having them and they're afraid to say it because people roll their eyes at them. Um, yeah. Oh, here. So can I, there's one story. I don't, this is not in the book, The Messengers. The book, The Messengers came out in 2015. And this experience happened afterwards. I had a, I had a hypnosis session with Yvonne Smith. Do you know okay. anything about this? Like, um, no, I know I know of her, but yeah, I, yeah. So Yvonne just... Smith, wonderful, sweet, kind woman. Very, very. She's a therapist first. Mm -hmm. She's trying to provide solace and healing for her clients and her patients. She also does UFO research. There's this myth on the outside that people are using hypnosis as a way to prove their point, like their pre preconceptions idea. But sure, they're seeding people or whatever. Else. Yeah, but yeah, Yvonne is trying to heal people. Yeah. And in the act, she's 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 got, you know, gotten these recorded transcripts and stuff like that. So she's also doing research. But f first and foremost, she's trying to provide healing. Um, so I call her up. I'm going to be in California. She's in Pasadena. I'm going to I was going to be traveling to California in August of 2018. I call her up and say, hey, Yvonne, I'm going to I'm going to be in town. We'd met at conferences. And I and I said, I would love to do a session. And she gets back to me right away and she says, Mike, what a nice surprise. Just this morning, I started reading your book, The Messengers. <laughs> it's been out, the book had been out for three years, and that was that morning. So we we um, set up the session, and so I'm in California. It's August. It's I'm at her office, and I and before I go under, I say, hey, when I'm under in this vulnerable spot, and you can access my my um, subconscious. You ask me what's up with the owls. Right. So I've been full-time owl research for 
a decade. And she says, of course. So, and we talked about the, a night, the night I hinted at earlier in March 10th, 2013, this event that took place. I'm happy to talk about it, but it's a little yeah. bit of a complex story. So right. we, we looked into that one night. I have no fear associated with, associated with that event. So this sweet, this story emerges under hypnosis and it gets like, wow, do I get like, do I get emotional? And I'm like swearing and it's really tough to listen to my hypnosis session. Yeah. And, and like, I'm like swearing at these beings and I'm like, and I'm angry and crying and emotional. It's brutal listening to me. And she, at one point she says, Mike, what do you, what do they want? What do they want from you? And I scream, they want me to play some role. And then whoosh, I'm out. I'm like out of that rage and I'm yeah. in this totally calm thing. And then we kind of keep going. She asks a few more questions. And I'm like, what happened? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know what just, what I just happened. And then she says, and Mike, what is your connection to owls? She, she says what I requested her to say at the beginning. I said, she mm -hmm. asked me what's up with the owls. And without skipping a beat, I say, the owls aren't important. Right? So I never would say that, right? The owls are the most important thing at yeah. that, just at that chapter of my life, that was owls were first and foremost. And that's what I got up every morning and I answered emails all day long and owls, 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 that's all I was doing. So she asked, what's up with the owls? I said, the owls aren't important. And then I said, and I, this stuff just rolls out of, off my tongue. It's just, it's just seared into me. I said, I am an artist and I understand how people take in a symbol and how we need a symbol. The owl is a symbol. The owl is a symbol on a door. The owl is not important, but it is the correct symbol for the door. We are on this side of the door in a tight, claustrophobic little hallway. And on the other side of the door is an infinite vastness. And then I kind of came out of it. And, and it's really interesting on this in the hypnosis session. I don't know if you've listened to hypnosis sessions, like like I've transcribed hypnosis. I've listened to like Whitley Strebers and a few others. Oh, but, people, yeah. people talk really slow and they whisper. <laughs> and there's lo it's really easy to transcribe. Long people like so ask a question, and then the person will say, maybe or they'll say yes so they're really easy to transcribe because yeah, people yeah. talk really slow and and then but i when i spoke this thing i spoke i spoke in a smoothness and a clarity that was outside the bounds of the normal the rest of the hypnosis session so that aspect the owl is not important it is a symbol the symbol it is the correct symbol but the owl itself isn't important that has helped me so much because before that point and it took me a kind of couple of years to, 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 to like let this percolate, but like I was clinging to the owl thing and in, I don't want to say an unhealthy way. I got some incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's focus yeah. and concentration, but after yeah. a while things can get unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. So I, so it, it allowed me, and that's why I'm very, that I'm, I want to make the point that there's these five other modalities and the owl is connected. To, the owl is connected to the highly charged human experience. The owl is not necessarily connected to the UFO thing, though the UFO thing is certainly a highly charged human experience. The owl is connected to these highly charged, seemingly mystical experiences. The owl flies at night in the dark. It is, it is essentially the shadow element. Right, so so Athena had an owl, and Zeus had an eagle. Right, they're both fierce predator birds. One flies in the empty blue sky, soaring for everyone to see. And that's the man, Zeus. The woman, um. Athena has the owl that flies in the darkness, that flies in the night, that is the shadow element. It is this, it is, a, it is a owl, uh, eagles have their own mythologies. It's, it is the flip-flop. It's the, it's the reverse of the same coin mm -hmm. where the owl, where the eagle is flying for everyone to see in the bright sunshine. And Zeus stands on his mountaintop bare-chested and, and his, his mythology is all connected to human frailties and, and jealousies and rage and, and lust. And Athena's mythology is all about art and wisdom. 
and and so the owl represents this feminine mystique that's hidden in the darkest shadows of the forest and and i really have taken that to heart that that's beautiful and um powerful um so real quick i mean we got a few minutes left if can you uh, give us a version of that confirmation story i want to hear it so i had a three events and these these i didn't figure this out that these three events were connected until march 10th 2013 i slept out under the stars i was coming back from a ufo conference in uh arizona i was living in idaho got to drive through Utah. I love Utah. Wow. This is like, this is like, I like, it's like driving through the, the, the location for the Roadrunner cartoons. It's like <laughs> glorious. I love it more than yeah. I can put into words. So, so I, I, I late at night, I pull off to the side of the road. It was probably wasn't that long. It's probably nine 30. The sun went down, but I laid down and I had, I did a lot of outdoor work. I got a great big thick sleeping bag. I got a great big thick sleeping pad. I put it in the back of my Subaru. I lay this pad down on the ground and I'm just at this, it's off highway 20 near, Beaver, Utah. And I'm like this, I'm, I fall asleep, it's glorious. And I wake up and I, and I look at this hilltop and there's this round structure on this hilltop. It's got lights around the edges of it. And I say to myself, it's like, I can look straight at it. It's like clear night, totally calm. There's nothing there. It's like, I got like, I'm just laying there staring at this round thing in the hilltop. And I say to myself, that looks just like a landed flying saucer. <laughs> and I, and I was like, well, like I'd been having psychic experiences at that point, And I'd been like doing the owl research and I felt like I was pretty tapped in. So I'm like, if this was a flying saucer, I would know it. I would feel some like flying saucer vibrations, you know, and I would know. And I looked at this thing, I felt nothing at all. And I'm like, oh, some big house, somebody built a big house up on the hill. So I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up again and there was a coyote near me, just close to me howling. And I have slept out thousands of nights in the back country. I've heard a lot of coyotes living out West. I've never, ever, ever heard one that close. So I sat up, it was remarkable. I sat up and I looked around, I'm in the sagebrush in this little parking lot kind of thing. It wasn't much, a little turnout. And, I, and I'm like, why don't I, what's going on? Why, like, why can't I see this thing? It felt like I could have taken a dog biscuit and just tossed it up in the air and it, this coyote could have <laughs> caught it in his mouth. So um, so then I look up and the round structure is still on the hill and I roll over and go back to sleep. And then a little while later, I don't know how long later, but some point in the night I woke up again and there was a bright light behind the bush. It was this juniper bush at my feet. And, and I was just like, someone parked on the other side of that bush? Is there a light on the other side of the bush? Doesn't, didn't look like a, I know what a headlights of a car would, appear like at night yeah didn't yeah. feel like that i know what someone with a flashlight walking around didn't feel like that it was something else and i was like okay so i'll i'll so i i i um get up the next morning and i pack everything up in the car it's interesting i i don't remember seeing the round structure on the hill when i packed up the stuff in the car it was still dark it was early in the morning yeah and i had a 10-hour drive to get home so i started at probably five in the morning or something like that and and um I'm, it may have been there and I may have seen it, but I simply don't remember seeing it. I certainly could have, but I don't remember. Now, um, I get home, I look up on Google Maps. Very first thing I do, I look up on Google Maps. What the hell was that bit brown building up on the hill? There's nothing. And I figure out the GPS cord. I'm very skilled with maps. I knew right where I camped. I knew right where the building was. Yeah. I knew but nothing. So I, I, I actually reached up, I contacted MUFON. I said, have you had any reports of anything last night? And they said, no. And then I, I did a drawing of the, of this craft, excuse me, I calling it a craft, the brown structure. And I put it up online. I wrote a little blog post about it. And then later I'm in my office and I'm just like standing next to my desk and I just like click. I have an image. Well, I'll do it for you. I have an image of a line and a map. I'll do this for you. This is not going to be very exciting but i'll do it for you anyway. <laughs> but so i have an image of a line on a map and it is a uh, uh, a diagonal line i think i got this right and then there's three push pins on the line like this and it's in this is it's like wow it was hyper vivid and mm -hmm. this was on uh overlaid over a map of southern utah and colorado yeah and i was like i knew exactly 
the thing that happened two nights before was the event that happened on the side of the road near Beaver, Utah on Highway mm. 20. Yeah. That was the westernmost point on the map. And I was like, what are the other things? Oh, I knew exactly what was the easternmost point on the map. I had an experience with a friend of mine, Natasha, where we were driving around the west. She's had her own contact experiences, very much qualifies as like someone who most probably had some sort of UFO contact. And she and I were driving around the West. We were dating at the time. She was from Germany. We had this wonderful trip in the West. We drove around for weeks. And, and there came a point when my car was making, like there was a funny smell in my brakes in the car. So I took the thing into the into the auto shop and the mechanic said, come back and we're like, well, let me look at this thing. So we didn't have anywhere to go. So we're just sitting in this beautiful spring day. And in, I think it was March of uh, 2000. 11 or 10 march of 2010 so we're sitting there and and uh and the mechanic comes out and he's like got his oily rag and he's wiping his hands off and he's like i can't let you leave town or you'll die <laughs> like, like whoa whoa you gotta fill me in what do you mean by that and he's like well if i let you leave town i'll be liable if you get into an accident so the brakes oh, are wow. not functional i can't let you i can't let you drive out without functional brakes and i'm like uh, okay so what does that mean he's like well i can get the parts the guy helped us out, the guy who ran the little shop. This is in a little town called Cortez, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And the guy helps us out and and uh, and gets us a rent a car. So then we're like, okay, we'll drive around for five days. It was actually really nice. The car was really nice compared to my dumpy old car. And so it was cheap and we had a great time. So we went to a, um, a sweat lodge ceremony the next day. Uh -huh really powerful this metaphoric exp it was like ran on it was on the navajo reservation near canyon de Chez, and it was a was a, a a powerful beautiful experience of the metaphor of death and rebirth run by he wasn't he's not a shaman but but one of the elders in the navajo tribe led this um ceremony and i would call it a shamanic ceremony but he wasn't a shaman he's been very clear about that don't call me a shaman so mm -hmm. and uh so so he we, it was beautiful. And then the, the issue was there was this point in the middle and I said, oh, I had this experience in the, so, so that was a long story that begins with someone saying, can't leave town or you'll die. And mm -hmm. it ends with a, with a, oh, wait a minute, I gotta, there's more to this story. So we, <laughs> sorry, this is a problem telling these things. No, so we camp out that night, yeah. Natasha, the night after we get the rent a car, we camp out that night and we are in a tent just on the side of the road. So this is near Dolores, Colorado, which is just a few miles down the road from, from um, Cortez, Colorado. And we wake up screaming. Both of us wake up screaming in the tent. And, and, and I'm, t I've, I was, I did outdoor work. I've got, I got no problem sleeping in a tent. Like yeah. I've never felt anything like this. I call it synthetic fear. It felt like, it felt like the fear didn't match normal reality. Like the sphere felt artificial. It felt yeah. like someone like shot me with a fear drug. It's what it felt like. Yeah. And so I'm just boom, 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 boom. I'm totally panicking. And like, we're both like, <laughs> what's what just happened? Both of us are on the exact equal level. She describes it the same way I do. And then I'm like, what happened? What happened? What happened? And she said, I saw a face. I'm like, well, like well, I'm like, we can get out of here. And she, she actually said something. Do you believe in evil ghosts? And I was like, I don't want to make this night any creepier. I don't have any. <laughs> so I was like, no, I don't believe in evil ghosts. So eventually we were panicked and then we both fall asleep. From like, just like freak out to asleep. And my very first memory is now this is foggy. Like I can tell you my memory. I don't think it happened like this. This is mm -hmm. my memory. Yeah. I don't think it happened like this. Okay. I'm rising out of, all of a sudden I'm like elevator up feeling. And I'm like, I'm rising up off the sleeping pad. And I look over and in the corner of the tent is a floating pizza pan shape floating there. And it's a circle. It's probably about the size of a pizza pan. Big, big pizza, large pizza. And it had a single dot in the middle. And then, so I'm floating up and I, and I pass right through the surface of the tent. And as I'm floating, I look at the circle, I look at the pizza pan, I, I say, I, I gotta remember this, I gotta remember this, I gotta remember this, I gotta remember this. And I float through the top of the tent and I'm in this white realm. I, I just passed through that, I didn't touch anything, I didn't feel anything. I just like, like if it was a movie, it would have been like a dissolve, you know, you mm -hmm. dissolve from one yeah. scene to the next. Yeah, yeah. And, and it would just dissolve to this white realm. And I, 
And I said, am I on a table? Am I on a table? Am I on a table? And then I heard Natasha's voice. She got a German accent. In her German accent, she said, Mike, you're floating. And I was back in the sleeping bag. Now, I don't think it happened like this. But yeah. that is exactly the memory. She doesn't have any memory of saying, Mike, you're floating. Yeah. So the next morning, it's interesting because I slept through the night. Usually I'll wake up, I'll toss and turn, I'll like, I woke, slept through the night. We both woke up, the birds are chirping, it's a beautiful sunshiny day. We're like, what happened last night? What happened? And she said, oh, I saw, I saw a face. And I said, can you describe this face? And she says, no. And I said, where was it? And she points exactly where I saw the floating pizza pan in the corner of the tent. Now, here's something, and I'm going to tell the story completely a little bit. There's this extra detail. In 2009, this was 2010, so a year before, I had a cataract. I was diagnosed with a cataract in my right eye. Mm -hmm. And for a few months, I could kind of squint into the sun and see an image in my eye. And this is in the, there's images in the book. And it was a face like this kind of ghostly skull-like gray alien-like face. Now, in, eerily, it looks like me. I'm bald and I have kind of big eyes. And, and, it, and it was like, it was a caricature of me. It was a caricature of me that blended into a death skull, that blended into a gray alien, that blended into sort of a seated Buddha. I mean, it's like, I, this, I could see it. This is, I remember thinking about this. The first day I saw it, I was like in a park, and I just squinted into the sun, kind of relaxing in this park. And you know how you can kind of just let the sunlight filter through your eyelashes and the shape just emerged. And it mm -hmm. was 100% my cataract. Yeah. So this little blob of like floating protein that's trapped in my cornea is like creating this image of me and no one else can see it. And my first thought was like, oh crap, now I got to put this on my stupid blog <laughs> and everyone's going to think I'm nuts. So I put it on my blog. I did this. I'm a very skilled illustrator. I did a rendering of it, I put it up there. And so when I was floating out of the tent, I looked at the, at the, at the pizza pan shape. It looked like it was a pizza pan and like translucent glass. It was kind of like sort of not quite in our reality or, but it was definitely in something that was in the tent that was seemed like two dimensional flat piece of glass yeah. pizza pan shape with a hole. And so, so I looked at that thing and I said, that looks like the thing in my eye. Thing, the, the, the image of my, it didn't look anything like the thing in my eye, but that's mm -hmm. what I said floating. I said, oh, that looks kind of like the thing in my eye. Now, Natasha, I wake her up the next morning. Like, what did you see? She said, I can't tell you. I can't describe it. Where was it? It was right there. I was like, well, please, come on, try to describe it. She said, well, the only way I can describe what I saw last night, you know that thing in your eye that you put on your blog, that illustration you drew? That's what it looked like. <laughs> Wow. Like, like, oh, and then I woke up the next morning, I had a big scratch across my chest. And then we went to the, we got up and we got in the car. We drove to the, to the, to the shamanic, well, it wasn't, it was to the Navajo reservation and had the sweat lodge ceremony. Yeah. And so, so there, there's that. Now, back to, there's so two lines in the map, right? So I got, here's my line in the map. So I know what the right and left things are, right? So I know what mm -hmm. this one is. I know what this one, east and west. It might be mirrored for you. I'm not sure what you're saying. The yeah. what's in the middle? What's that one in the middle? I thought, like, I had a, I've traveled a lot in southern Utah. And I kind of said, oh, there was that thing that happened on the Burr Trail Road. Now, Burr Trail Road is this this kind of empty, empty part of a very empty state. And and it was right near the town called Boulder, Utah, which is tiny. So so I was a year later, this was a year after in 2011, I was traveling with Natasha. We were sleeping outside on the Burr Trail Road. And again with Natasha, she came back from, she came from Germany for another trip. We love the desert. And, and so we're sleeping out on the Burr Trail Road. She's from Germany, so she's jet lagged. We had just come back from a UFO conference in Arizona and she's jet lagged. I'm tired, so she can't sleep. I need to sleep. And she wakes me up and says, Mike, I can't sleep. We're sleeping out under the stars. Beautiful spot. And and I say, uh, take a walk. Like she's like, What do I do? I can't sleep. I said, Take a walk. It's a beautiful night. And she said, Really? It's like, is it safe? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's safe around here. So she gets up and she walks off. I lay there and I sort of drift in and out of sleep, and she's just walking away. She doesn't she not she didn't go very far. So but but while I'm laying there, I hear a great horned owl in the bush near my head. 
It was so loud. I don't understand why I didn't see it. I sat up. I tried to see this owl. I'm like, it is right there in that bush. I can't see it. It was dark, obviously, but mm -hmm. I didn't turn a flashlight on or anything. Yeah. So, so I cannot, I have to treat this similar to the coyote that I heard on March 10th, 2013 on that night. It was yeah. so close I, and so loud. I don't understand why I couldn't see it. Same feeling. In retrospect, looking back at these events now, I would argue, I can't say it's true, but I, I'm open to the thought that these were some sort of audio screen memories Yeah. with the owl and the coyote. Now, I'm listening to this owl drifting in and on this magical place, drifting in and on sleep, beautiful night, a place I love, cold, trillions of stars. Natasha walks away. She says, when I walked away, I didn't, I had my flashlight. I didn't need it. It was the starlight was lighting up everything. There was no moon, the starlight. She said it was so beautiful and so still, it felt like I was sparkling. That's pretty good. Yeah. So she walks along the road. She, we have it right on the map. She put an X right where she got to. She said, I was, and I looked off on the side of the road and there was a, there was a, someone, there was a light out there. She stopped and is someone out there with a flashlight? And, and she's, and, and, and she's, she looks at this thing and then the light grows big, whoosh, like big, like the size of a beach ball. And it's a floating orb and it floats towards her and then poof, it disappears. And now she's scared. She comes back, wakes me up. Mike, we got to get out of here. And she explains what happened. And now I'm scared. And so we get out of there and drive away. I don't know what time it was, like five in the morning or something. Now, she had, so I was listening to an owl. She saw a floating orb. That's a UFO. Owl and UFO, completely co-joined. I asked her. Did you hear the owl? She said, no, I never heard an owl. This is like desert at night. There's no place in the world on a still night. The sound just travels for yeah. infinity. Yeah. She should have heard that owl totally clear. It was loud, loud, loud. We look at the map and it's like, she was less than a football field away. She wasn't that far away, yeah. less than a hundred yards away. What was the relationship between the, the ball of light and where you were at? If she was away from you and she was looking at the ball of light, it wasn't anywhere near where you were at. About a, less than 100 yards away. Yeah, I got it figured out on a map. Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't with you. It was somewhere else. Just like, I, if I stood up, I would have I would have been able to. If it was daylight, I could have just stood up and, and we could have talked in a loud voice to each other. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. It was close. It was close. Yeah. And um, so when I lined that thing up in the middle, right? So I was just like, right? So I had I was making maps. I had already made a map of the site on, and I had the spot pinpointed where I was sleeping and where the where the round structure on the hill was I had those pinpointed on a map so I just built another built on top of that map on Google Maps it was a very simple map making process and I put a little push pin at the spot where I was at in Dolores Colorado mm -hmm. and I put a push pin at the spot where I was at in off the Birch Trail Road and then I you know we have a little clicker and I just clicked on the yellow line and 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 so you take up you take a wire or a piece of string and you pull it really tight it's going to make a straight line mm -hmm. between any two points you got a straight line yeah that middle point the chances of it bisecting that middle point was exactly where i was lying in the sand exactly where i was lying in the sand and that is when i said when that that the tape loop came out of my head yeah that yeah. was the moment the tape loop came out of my head like this is real yeah i I say my, I knew, I knew in that moment, my old life ended and my new life has begun. My old life is gone. My old life was doubting, anxious, and that, that was gone. I no longer doubt the reality of it. I don't know the source, but I, but I, there's something going on. Now, let's a couple, there's some weird details. So of the two points in the map, of the three points in the map, right? Dolores, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then the Birch Trail Road, I was with mm -hmm. Natasha on um, Highway 20, the round structure on the hill. I was alone. Mm -hmm. March 10th, 2013. I was alone. March 10th is Natasha's birthday. Like, well, like, what the, how do you, how do you, <laughs> like, so she wasn't there, but it was happened on her birthday. So it's like, how do yeah. I separate these, this? And then uh, like it goes on and on and on. She studied with Dolores Cannon and we had an experience in Dolores CO, which is 
that's a little thing, but wow, she took that very seriously. She was yeah. startled by that. But now, it's like this cascading series of like oh, little tiny things that just make it oh, weave it, together, right? The, yeah. The tapestry is so tight and every little thread, the thread over here is somehow connected to the thread over here yeah. and you pull any one thread and it just, oh, it's a mess. It's just, it's a tough, that's, it's, it's, so there's my, my, my confirmation. Let me just add one thing. The night of March 10th, 2013, which was, I had the confirmation event on March 12th, right? Because I had to take a day to get drive back. And then I drew the pictures and I made some blog posts. And then the next day I had the psychic vision of the three points on the map. And <clears throat> if, if Yvonne Smith's hypnosis session is treated literally, I'm kind of panicking there on her couch. And she says, Mike, what do they want? And I scream out, they want me to play some role. And then poop, I'm out of the, the depths of the freak out. And then I'm in this calm place. So March 12th, two days after, less than 48 hours after sleeping on the side of the road in Southern Utah, I started the book, The Messengers. I started writing that book on March 12th. Formally started writing that book on March 12th. Now, wow. that's less than 48 hours after I had an experience where Yvonne Smith said, like, I'm freaking out of a memory that happened on March 10th, 2013. Seemingly, I'm yeah. cautious to put, treat this as, and then, and she says, you know, why, why are you so emotional? And I said, they want me to play some role. So like I, there's, in the book, you read it. I mean, I speculate straight up. I speculate straight up that like this book, I don't say it's true. What I do, I say this book feels like it has been written or I, planned I, out and uh, yeah. impelled. I was impelled yes, exactly. to write this book by an outside source. Yeah. I say it multiple times in the book and I mean it. That's what it felt like. That doesn't make yeah. it, that doesn't make it true, but that is certainly what it felt like. So there, there's a long, long, long story to, to try to bring you up to speed on what my confirmation event was. Yeah, I love it, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us. Um, I uh, That's pretty much all I have for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to include that I didn't ask about? I wrote a novel. I'm going to push that. So I wrote yeah, a novel. let's do it. Okay, what's it so called? Here's the, the I'm going to link your, I'm gonna link to all your work on in the description. Great. If you could just go to my page, the MikeClellan.com, all the books are listed there. So here we go. Okay. Here's the novel. Um, I don't know if it's backwards for you. It's backwards for me. No, but, uh, I can see it. Yeah. Great. And so it, um, <clears throat> it, when I've been getting, I get letter after letter after letter, I'm getting, s this is not an exaggeration. Lately, I've been getting six powerful owl stories a day. Wow. Roughly fluctuates a little bit, but that's yeah. <laughs> six a day is on a good day. So, and what I can say is, and I've been, that's been, it, that's, it's getting, it's getting more and more and more as time goes on. I'm getting more and more. It's not tapering off. It's it's increasing. Yeah. So, and that's been going on for 15 years. So I have a I have I have so much data, and these are personal stories. These are heartfelt stories, and people are sharing these stories. And within those stories is a flavor and mood that I find totally palpable. Someone will yeah. tell me a story. They said, "Have you ever heard?" anyone tell this story? And I said, well, I haven't heard that story exactly, but I have heard many, many, many stories with the same flavor and mood. And that's what I tried to imbue this work of fiction with, is okay. that sense of mystery. And and I I was really nervous putting the book out and, and the, the, um, the reviews on Amazon are telling me that people got it. Yeah. People tapped into that mystery. Okay. I will uh, try and read it if I can find the time and I'll put a review up um, at, there in Goodreads. I have an account over there. Um, and, uh, and there's an audiobook. The audiobook just came out two days ago for, for the Unseen. Okay, cool. Excellent. All right, sir. Well, I appreciate your time and thank you for all your hard work and for putting together a really good book and for giving me an experience that I'm never going to forget. You know, you mentioned the birthday synchronicity there with uh, your friend. Uh, I mentioned that it was my dad's birthday mm -hmm. on the day that I saw the owl on the same day that we had discussed. That's just, I mean, you know. Well, yeah. So that's it's like there's a fabric that just lines up where each synchronicity is not necessarily this outstanding exclamation point, but they're little tiny things that add relevance and meaning to the overall event, you know, and it's, yeah. 
so so strict materialist would say don't you get sucked into those coincidences yeah don't you do that don't you be simplistic in your thinking and i'm like no 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 like someone someone contacted me or actually i was in a, at a ufo conference before but well long before the book and someone said like well you know like what are you doing at the ufo conference when i'm like well i'm kind of doing research and they're like what are you researching and i had to think well, like i'm researching myself I'm researching my own experiences mm -hmm. and they were like well, well how what's going on how's your life changed since looking into this and i had to think and i said i now live in a magical universe exactly right exactly yeah. right and i've gone through the same experience with this podcast yeah. Like my, my, my whole horizon has opened up. It's just a totally different way of thinking and of being. And it's so much more fulfilling. Even if all this is just in my head, I'd rather live here than where I was at before, because it's stripped of all relevance and meaning for anything deeper than surface. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So we're, 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 I mean, there's a reason to go out and measure the burn marks in the farmer's field and write it down in a little book and such but there's yeah. also reason to and i try to be really cautious and you i've done it too many times probably in this thing where i say like i if i know something i'm really content saying what i know and if i don't know it i can i'll say i'm speculating mm -hmm. but but wow my life is just exactly what you said my life is so much more rich since since looking into this mystery yeah Awesome, sir. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you very much.